sound? I don't... There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. My name is Gary Dusbabic. I work for Rackspace in San Antonio, Texas. Um, currently, I work on the cloud monitoring team. We make a monitoring product that, uh, that people can uh, use to monitor external things or install the agent and monitor things inside their servers. And I've worked on that project for a couple years now. And before that, I, uh, I worked on Cassandra full time. I'm a project committer and, and quite familiar with the, the ins and outs of Cassandra. So if you have Cassandra questions later, you can, you can hit me up for that. But uh, that's a little bit about me and what I do. The outline that we're going to follow today is uh, first, I'm going to kind of give you a description of what Blue Flood is. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why we built it. I'm going to demonstrate or explain to you some of the primitives inside of uh, Blue Flood. And then kind of spill the guts of the project. And we'll proceed that way. But uh, first things first, you know, this is a, an open source conference. You know, we've, we've used a lot of open source to, to build Blue Flood. And along, I, I, it was my goal and intention to, to make this open source. And Rackspace is making it a little bit easier for us to do this. We've been given permission to do it, but we need to go through the code and take out some specific branding things and make some things a little bit more obvious. And uh, we're, we're working on that. So my goal, my personal goal, is that by the end of the month of June, that we should have uh, Blue Flood available for you to download off of GitHub, use some good documentation, and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be, be, be ready by then. Our, our goal, you know, lots of times when projects go from being closed source to open source, you know, they can, they can turn out one way. Um, this isn't what you really want. This is, uh, this is bad. Um, some projects you've seen, they just package their code up and kind of throw it over the wall and uh, then kind of abandon it or forget about it. And uh, that's, that's not what we want to do. We want to spend some time, make sure the documentation is good, uh, do what we can to foster a community. And uh, I think it's going to, to work out better that way. And so if at the end of the presentation, any of you are, are kind of interested in, in learning more about this, um, either sync up with me in person or on Twitter, and uh, we can, can find a way to kind of uh, expose, expose Blue Flood to you. So what is Blue Flood? It's basically three things, or at least it's supposed to do three things well. Uh, the first thing is ingest metrics. Metrics come into the system. It persists them. And then we've taken the approach that we want to roll metrics up. And this is for a couple of optimizations, um, mainly along the read path so that we can guarantee a constant service level for users. The last thing that it does is it allows users to query those metrics. And so those are, those are the three things it does. And we've tried to make it a simple project. So those are the only things it does. We've tried not to, to leak out too many things. Um, in this presentation, you'll hear me use the word metric and signals kind of interchangeably. So when you see a signal, that's the same thing as a metric. Um, I might even slip up and say stream or something like that. But they're all the, all the same thing. Uh, Blue Flood is written in Java, um, mainly because the engineers that we had tasked to work on Blue Flood were, were that was their, their primary language. On uh, cloud monitoring, we have, uh, it really is a, a polyglot system. We try to pick the best language for the task. We've got things written in Node, things written in Lua, things written in C. And uh, I think for this project, Java really was the, the best choice. Um, mainly because of the libraries that are, are available to us uh, for doing uh, concurrent things. And uh, that's mainly what we, we ended up going with. For storing the data, we currently use Cassandra. The reading and writing um, constructs within the code are going to be easy enough to extract interfaces out of so that other backends can be used to store the data. And so you know, whatever, whatever you want, I think that we're going to be able to, to do that. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, we use Cassandra mainly because we have a lot of in-house experience with Cassandra. We know how to, how to make it do these things. And it turns out that Cassandra is a pretty good uh, time series database right out of the box. I'll get to some diagrams a little bit later that'll explain that to you and make that a little bit more obvious. Some of the reasons why we built this is our first and primary objective was we wanted to have fast graphs for the user. Um, the system is uh, built to hold data for many customers. We didn't want the volume of data for one customer to impact the service level for another customer. And so we, we optimized everything so that we could make the, the graphs as fast as possible. I already talked about how we have uh, multiple tenants. 
We wanted this to be kind of a cheap system. Keep in mind that uh, our primary product is, is a monitoring software. It's not generating pretty graphs or, or pictures or dashboards for people. And of course, we want it to be maintainable. We have uh, quite a bit of uh, servers for the project, and we don't want to burden our, our operations people. So I'll, I'll go kind of deeper into each of these right now. So fast graphs, as I said before, our primary job isn't uh, isn't um, to, to generate dashboards and, and graphs as a cloud monitoring, but for Blue Flood, that's, that's its main thing. And so we have to be able to get at that data quickly. The, the way that we do that is we optimize the read path so that we don't do some things as, as often as uh, might be done other, other ways. We want to return as few data points as possible. And along that same line, we want to make sure that uh, as much as possible, we pre-compute things. When you, when you look at, uh, I guess, the big picture, there's a sweet spot in a graph. You can only contain, it, uh, any graph can only contain so much information before it just becomes too dense. If you've ever tried to put 100,000 or even 10,000 points into a, a single graph that might be 400 pixels wide, you quickly realize well, I can't really see all those data points. You know, and we've found that in practice, most of the time, you can see between three and 400 distinct uh, data points on a normal sized graph that, that appears in a browser. And so we've optimized along those lines. We want to make a system that it's easy to pull out um, for any given period of time, something that represents 300, 300 to 400 data points. And um, users can, can then turn those into, into graphs. As I said before, you just, you just can't fit much, much else into a graph. Um, supporting multiple tenants. Cassandra makes this pretty easy for us because it gives us a, a per column TTL. And so different customers, um, you know, depending on how long they want to retain their data for, can, can pay to, to have it uh, kept for longer. And this is uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty customizable. For the most part, you know, a standard uh, time to live is used but uh, for those who want longer retention, we've made it easy and, and possible for, for them to do that. So the next step is, well, we wanted something that was kind of cheap. Um, we realized that we have this you know, medium-sized Cassandra cluster, um, and it was, uh, it was using a lot of disk, but it wasn't really uh, using a lot of the CPU. Well, pre-computing this data, rolling it up, is very CPU intensive and, and really not, not so disk intensive until the end where it's, where it's written. So we decided um, to go ahead and co-locate our, our Blue Flood instances with the Cassandra instances. And so we get a little bit of a, of a bonus there because the Cassandra reads uh, go to localhost, or the Cassandra reads and writes go to localhost um, for the Cassandra, uh, as the Cassandra con controller the writes may end up going all around the cluster, but that first hop is always a, 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 local, a local host hop. And of course, it's, uh, you know, if, if local host, for whatever reason, isn't available, it will try other nodes in the Cassandra cluster. But um, this, is, this has worked well for us. We also theorize, I'm pretty sure, that uh, Blue Flood would also work good in a, like a hybrid cloud environment where you host your Cassandra on real hardware and you host your Blue Flood instances on virtual hardware because it's, I mean, it's mainly you just need CPU and uh, to some degree memory. As far as maintaining the, the Blue Flood cluster, we, we wanted it to, to be something that is, uh, we spin it up and then we kind of uh, forget about it, let it just do its job. Um, we didn't want it to have a lot of tunable knobs that uh, our admins have to worry about or that we have to worry about. We did spend a lot of time uh, making sure that it's well instrumented um, so that we can just pull things up in a, in a JMX console or you know, we're, we're also getting the metrics into StatsD and, and uh, Graphite. We wanted to be able to make sure that we have a, a good view of what's going on inside the system and so we've heavily instrumented it quite a bit. Um, Again, we just we don't want this to, to be a burden for our operations people. We want something that uh, that can easily be tuned, and uh, it scales horizontally. I'll get into details about how it scales uh, later on, but basically you just add servers, make a few small configuration changes, and uh, you're you're on your way when it's time to to uh, to scale. 
One of the other things I think that helps with maintenance is, as I said before, BlueFlight has three jobs, ingest, rollup, and query. We decided to build this into one process and one code base. And so when you spin up a BlueFlight instance, you can just uh, tweak its configuration, and um, it, can, it can do either all of these tasks, or, or some of them, or even one of them. And uh, that's fine. In our, in our own cluster, we have, uh, we have a couple query slaves, um, a couple ingestion slaves, and then the bulk of them, the ones that we've co-located co with the Cassandra nodes, are uh, roll-up slaves only. All right, the concepts. So we ended up borrowing a lot of vocabulary from other things, and in some cases it may not make sense, but I'll do my best to, uh, to try and, and help you to, to understand that. The first thing is the concept of a metric. There's certain things that, uh, attributes of a metric, and as I said, a metric's also known as a signal. First thing above all is that a metric obviously has some data, and then it's going to have a little bit of metadata in for, uh, associated with it. The first thing is that it can have type information associated with it. Uh, we treat integers differently than floats, and we treat strings and booleans even differently than we treat uh, integers and floats. Um, and those are the, the basic uh, types of data that, uh, that BlueFlight has. If the, if the metadata or the type information um, isn't sent with the metric when it comes in, it does its best to try and figure it out. And usually that's, I mean, pretty obvious. Um, something else that can be associated with the metric is uh, unit information. This comes in handy on the query end. Um, users really sometimes like to know whether this thing that they're querying represents bytes, megabytes, milliseconds, things like that. Again, this is, a, this is an optional piece of meta information that can be included with a metric. Something else about a metric is it has to be uniquely identifiable. It has to be addressable um, because it ends up getting stored in a single row in Cassandra, and we need to be able to, to look that up. And the way that we've, uh, we, we've called that, uh, that primary key a locator, and so throughout the code base you'll see you know, the, this concept of a locator. It's basically just a primary key into the system. And some things, to the system, it's just an opaque string. Um, it, it just treats it like a string. But what we do, and what we would encourage anyone else who uses BlueFlood to do, <clears throat> is to stuff all kinds of data in that string. Um, as much data as you want, as, as, much, as, as much as makes sense. Um, a good example, this is one that we, you might see in our system. Uh, the first, there's a tuple, it's uh, a, a tuple separated by um, a colon. The first uh, element it represents um, a tenant ID or a customer or something like that. The next part represents a host, then a disk in the host, and then some attribute on that disk. And so there might be multiple attributes on the disk, and then again multiple disks and hosts and tenants. You get the idea, it goes on and on. So it's a way for us to kind of... Uh, um, and this is probably a good pattern to, to practice because it just it makes your data easier to find later on. Uh, an example of uh, of how metrics look as a row. So we have the the key with the locator, and that goes in along with the first column. So each um, each unit of data has a timestamp associated with it, and that is the timestamp the data was generated, which is different than the time on the server or the time that it's actually getting written. This is the, the time that the, the, gener uh, the, the data came from whatever it was collected from. Um, as we get more data in, it just gets appended. Again, this is a you know, simple time series database uh, concepts, and if you've uh, done this kind of thing before, it's probably pretty, pretty easy to understand. We've also broken a blue flood cluster up into shards. Now, shards are simply just a way to break the metric space up into parts that can be processed individually. Um, every metric, oh, yeah, so you determine how many shards you want to have, call that in, and then every, every metric hashes to one of those shards. And that's just a way of knowing who is going to be responsible for rolling up that metric later on. Our current system uses 128, and that's hard-coded in. Um, it may make sense to make this uh, configurable setting at some point. There's not a lot of penalty that you would get by increasing your shards later on. Um, you would have to kind of just uh, either destroy and let naturally repopulate some state information, 
or do something to uh, to to repopulate it yourself. You know, some kind of manual manual um, trans transition. Um, but you should generally pick something big enough. Uh, you know, to where you think it might be the maximum nodes you would ever have to have uh, processing your, your shards. And so we've got it set to 128. We've currently got 32 nodes processing shards, and they're split into two data centers. And so each set of uh, 16 nodes processes all the shards, and we have some mechanisms that I'll talk about later that we make sure that we, we use some uh, locking constructs to make sure that only one node is processing a, a shard at a given time. Um, each node is going to own one or more nodes. So when I, when I spoke about our instance, we have 16 nodes that uh, 128 shards are divided up evenly on. So each one processes so many nodes. Shards themselves can be owned by one or more nodes. You have to have uh, at least one node to own a shard or else that, uh, those, uh, those keys, those uh, locators will never ever get rolled up. Um, but it's OK for a shard to be owned by multiple nodes. We use a Zookeeper to make sure that uh, we use Zookeeper to make sure that only one node is processing it at a, at a given time. Shards have nothing to do with query and very little to do with uh, metrics ingestion. So they mainly exist for the, for the sake of uh, rolling the data up. And I think I'm about to explain rollups, but I'll first talk about how we, uh, we use Zookeeper to kind of manage this. Um, Zookeeper is something that right now, it's, uh, it's kind of optional. There's no penalty imposed by letting um, multiple nodes process the same shards. It's just that multiple work is going to be getting done, and why not uh, save yourself the hassle? But Zookeeper is kind of a pain in the neck dependency. I mean, we've, also, we've already got a dependency on Cassandra, which is kind of onerous. Well, I have this dependency on Zookeeper. So this is something I'd like to, to see go away. And I think with a little bit of work that, that this will probably go away eventually. Um, like I said before, it's okay for either Zookeeper to fail or to not be there in the first place. There's a simple configuration setting that says, um, everyone just process your shards, pretend like there's no Zookeeper. But if uh, Zookeeper is acting up, then uh, it fails in a safe manner and multiple nodes will process the same shards. And that's fine. Um, all the roll-up operations in Blue Flood are idempotent. And so we don't have to, to worry. I mean, you can roll up the same range of time over and over again and you're going to get the same result. Um, you know, unless new data is coming in. Um, the concept of granularity. Granularity is a way that we use to uh, divide up time. And this is something that, that's, uh, that's hard to explain, so I've got a picture. When data first arrives, it arrives at full resolution. Um, it, it can arrive spaced evenly in time, but uh, that doesn't have to always be the case. It can uh, arrive sporadically. Full resolution kind of doesn't get divided up into slots, but um, what happens is as the roll-up slaves start doing their processing, the first step is to process at five-minute uh, granularity. So the granularity goes from full to five minutes to 20 minutes to 60 minutes to four hours to 24 hours. Um, a five-minute roll-up will take all data that's received in those five minutes condense that down to one data point, and it will wait for the time that it has to come and do that again. Now, encoded in these data points are a couple things. We include the count, the max, the min, the um, count, max, min, the uh, variance, and the average. Um, we, we thought about including some more statistical information in there, um, and we reserve the right to do that in the future. The, the data structure, as it gets saved to the database, is versioned, and so we can uh, change it later on to add more data if it, if it proves useful. But we figured by storing those things that we can do quite a bit of uh, statistical analysis on, on just that data, and that's, that's pretty simple. That's you know, five, five data points encoded up into these little roll-ups. So anyway, we get to the end, and eventually it's time to start creating 20-minute roll-ups. And so what happens is the, a 20-minute roll-up is, is uh, composed of one, two, three, four, uh, five-minute roll-ups. We don't uh, use the full resolution data to, 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 to create that. Um, there's nothing that says that we can't, and maybe that's a better idea. That's something we, we just haven't uh, experimented with. And the 20-minute roll-ups work like as you expect, and then the same thing with the one-hour roll-ups, uh, three 20-minute roll-ups, get condensed into a, a one-hour roll-up. And so 
inside that one data point, you're going to have the count of all these things, um, the average of all those things, a good approximation of the variance of all those things, and also the min and the max of all those things. And also, it get, the same process happens for four-hour and 24-hour roll-ups. These values were arbitrarily chosen. Um, it may prove that, uh, that we don't need some of them at some point, but these are the ones we're using right now, and it, it, it offers us enough flexibility to, uh, to make sure that we can have a consistent service level for, for our users as far as returning them the right number of data points uh, for their queries. Um, so the concept of a slot. So if, if you can, just imagine a two-week period, and it's divided up into five-minute chunks. So in a, each, each chunk, yeah, as I said, is five minutes long. So in a single day, you're going to have 288 of those. And in that two-week period, you're going to have 4,032 of those. Now, we give each of those a number, you know, starting with uh, zero. They end with 4,031. And so those, those, uh, these slots reset every two weeks. So they go back to, back to zero, like that. I really like using Keynote. Um, so the same concept is repeated for the other granularities, except there's just going to be less slots for them because they represent bigger swath of time. So for five minutes, we have uh, 4,032. And as you see, as time, as the granularity gets more coarse, the number of slots in them gets less. And so finally, it ends with 24 hours, which obviously have 14 24-hour slots in them. Um, every timestamp which is when a metric was received or recorded, hashes into one of these slots. And so then we can use that information to know what slots are kind of dirty or what slots are active so we know which time periods that we then need to go and roll up. So as I said, that's how we know if a metric is, is, is active. Um, we keep track of that slot in a, in a data structure that gets uh, serialized into Cassandra. That's a little bit of a state. And other nodes uh, periodically pull that out and uh, update their state. And it's OK if it's a little bit out of sync. Um, the worst thing that can happen is an extra roll-up or two happens. And that's totally fine with us. We track these, this state information in a uh, column family that has a 48-hour time to live. And so if we stop receiving a metric, we're going to realize that 48 hours later, and we'll stop rolling it up. And so that's, that's convenient. That's how we know when to and to not roll up a, uh, um, a specific metric anymore. Uh, Cassandra makes that really handy with, with, with TTL columns. So data coming into the system. It, uh, I've probably already done a good job discussing what attributes a metric has. Basically, those, those things. Um, yeah, we've talked enough about collection time. Type and unit, as I said before, are just optional. Um, metrics arrive into the system somehow. Our current implementation uses Thrift. We're going to ship it when we first release it open source with an HTTP uh, transport. But um, it's going to be flexible enough for you to, to swap those out. Um, they pass through a series of transforms. Um, like for us, we get the, t the, the TTL information from a, like an account API that goes into Rackspace systems, pulls the, the, the TTL out and then augments the metrics with that. They don't arrive with the TTL. And um, we do also some other things to kind of guess what the, uh, the units are. Um, we use a heuristical approach where we, um, based on what the metrics name is, we assume whether it's like bytes or milliseconds or hours or something like that. Those, uh, that series of transforms will be customizable, or you can implement your own so that you can, you can transform the data to the way that you want before it actually gets written to Cassandra. And then, of course, it gets written to the, to the full resolution column family. Um, it also gets written to the discovery database. And that's how we know what metrics are active for a given shard. So we know which metrics to query when it's time to roll up a shard. And then also, I mentioned I discussed the, the slot state before. That's how we know that a specific slot is, is dirty and is in need of being rolled up. Um, Ingestion is designed to be pluggable. We want it to be extensible so that you can customize it to, to fit your needs. And so that's, that's one of the things that uh, we're working hard to make sure that's right before we actually release the code. And another thing that we're doing is um, 
as we modify the code to make it open source, we're continually deploying this in our production and, and staging environments. So we want to make sure that we don't, uh, when we actually open up the source, that we don't you know, deliver a, a turd to everybody. We want something that uh, we can say, hey, we're using this in our, in our production environments. This is something that we trust with our data. You can trust it with your data, too. Um, if you're a coder, this is going to be pretty easy. You just swap in your transport, swap in your, your transforms, and you're good to go. Um, or you can just live with the defaults. When we, when we finally ship it, I think we're just going to have the HTTP as the default, and there'll be a, a default safe set of uh, TTLs for all the data. Something um, about ingestion is uh, sometimes you've got collectors that are just kind of late to the, to the game with their, with their data. Late data is okay um, up to that two-week period where the slots reset themselves. If, uh, if data is later than that, we, we discard it. We actually, in our system, discard it. We, we, we don't allow data older than 24 hours in. If you want data that's older 24 hours, it's probably going to make mo more sense for you to write a short little Java program to use uh, some of the libraries that Blue Flood comes with to, to bulk load the data yourself and, uh, and backfill that way. But um, late data is OK. What it just means is it, it just marks that slot dirty, and the scheduling algorithm picks up that slot and then just re-rolls it up, and this time includes the updated data. And that trickles on up as the granularity is get co uh, more coarse all the way up to, to 24 hours if it's you know, truly that late. Um, discuss that. All right. The process of rolling up the data is, uh, is a little bit complicated. Um, conceptually, it's something I think that's, that's pretty simple, but the actual code that does it is, is some of the, the trickier parts. Um, so when a slot hasn't been updated for more than five minutes, it gets scheduled to, to be rolled up. Um, typically, the, the delta between when it's scheduled and when it actually is rolled up is quite small. But if you're in a system where you know, you're constantly getting data that's just a little bit late, a couple seconds late, um, if new data arrives while that uh, slot was scheduled, and it's for that same slot, the slot will become descheduled, and we'll have to wait you know, for its, uh, its uh, five-minute timeout period to happen again until it can be rescheduled. So we try to be smart about it that way. Um, yes. So when we realize that a slot is, uh, is five minutes old, hasn't received any data, we select out all the locators or the metrics that were updated during that slot. And we get that from the, the state database. And then for each locator, we get all the data points that correspond to that range. That's, uh, again, a Cassandra read operation. And then we do the maths. Like I said, we, com we compute the count, the min, the max, the variance, and then the average. And uh, those things get serialized into a little object that then gets written to Cassandra. Um, and then this process gets repeated you know, on up the, up the chain per granularity. Um, we tried to, uh, something that, that's tricky is uh, scheduling. For example, I don't know if I include this example or not. Yes. So we wouldn't want to roll up a one hour uh, slot or range if all of its 20 minute roll ups haven't been computed yet because, of course, the one hour roll up is computed from the 20 minute um, roll up. And so the, the scheduling algorithm has to be smart enough to kind of uh, realize uh, parent child relationships between slots. And it does that, and it, uh, and it works pretty well for that. Something else, uh, as far as planning out what the Blue Flood cluster does, is we want to make sure that it doesn't get behind. So roll ups get scheduled every five minutes. If you find that you can't compete, complete all of your rollups within five minutes, well, then your cluster, or at least that particular node, is under-provisioned, which means it's probably just processing too many shards. Um, the, and the thing to do there is just to take away some of those shards from that server and give them to another server. And so that's a pretty, pretty simple operation. All right, the query API, this is... Uh, this is something that probably will change quite a bit in the future. It's, uh, it's a simple part, but it's a part that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's pretty simple. There's, there's a lot of room for improvement here, to be honest, and that's why I think it, it will, there's um, going to be changes. There's two methods that we use to query the API. The first method is basically um, get by points. So we pass in a metric ID, a time range, and then how many points you want. So 
you know, if you're generating a graph that's going to go on a little dashboard web page, you'd pass in the, the metric ID. Um, that could be whatever. It could be one day. It could be a year. And then the number of points that you want. And so you'd say, I want 500 points. I want 1,000 points. I want 20 points. The algorithm then, the code then chooses the best fit granularity uh, to deliver you that many points. And you know, depending on certain factors, it could be pretty close or it could be, it could be off because it just it tries to find the one that makes the, the best fit for, for what you've asked for. But sometimes it's, it's, uh, the best fit isn't uh, really that close to what you want. The other query method is the one that has more control. You just get everything by resolution. So you pass in some of the same things, a metric ID, a range, and then a resolution. And so this is the way you have the most control. But you run the risk of, um, of just returning too much data points. That's fine from a Cassandra perspective. It's just one simple read operation. But you know, you'll find that the more data points you feed to these graphing libraries, the longer that they take to, uh, to generate their graphs. And uh, users, in our experience, don't tolerate slow graphs at all. They just they, they get the heck out of there. Um, so just you know, watch out for that. That's something pretty, pretty easy. Um, as I said before, we optimize the system around fast reads and uh, consistent reads because you know, our users, they have to have a, a guaranteed experience. We're currently using this in the, in the uh, Rackspace control panel. If, you have, if you're using Rackspace and use cloud monitoring, either external checks or agent checks, you can see the graphs generated by this system in your, uh, in your control panel right now. That's everything that I have. Um, are there any questions? I'm happy to, to uh, answer any questions. You can throw sticks at me, ask why you did that, or, or anything. I'm happy to hear anything. Is there some sort of alerting or just monitoring? Some sort of what? Uh, alerting. <clears throat> alerting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cloud monitoring does all the alerting. And so, I mean, Blue Flood itself exposes a number of metrics that we could then feed into our alerting system. And keep in mind that uh, metrics reporting and alerting systems, even though they all are underneath cloud monitoring, are completely orthogonal. Um, so if our monitoring system is broken, we're still going to be ingesting metrics. And so, I mean, it's, sometimes when systems are related, you have a problem if one dog foods off the other. Well, if one fails, you don't know if, if it's, which one's causing it. Um, we, would, uh, we, we use a, a different, uh, different uh, tools for monitoring. We currently use uh, Graphite, and um, we feed our metrics in, or we feed log statements into Graylog. We, we have uh, it set so that Graylog, um, if it returns so many types of errors, will get some kind of alert. Uh, Nagios also uh, gets a lot of those uh, blue flood metrics and can then send us alerts. So um, we've set thresholds that we think are tolerable. And again, this is a new system to us, so we're kind of figuring out what's, what's right as far as uh, the different metrics that we have inside blue flood. Okay. Um, how do you handle delays or data corruption in your input data? Garbage in, garbage out. So if, uh, if the data coming in is, is uh, bad, you know, Blue Flood is it's a dumb system. It doesn't know how to judge the data, whether it's, it's good or bad. There is a certain level of uh, verification that has to take place, um, certain things that the metrics have to have. Um, or else they kind of uh, they get booted out of the system. We, we log that at a warning or an error or something like that. We also have the concept, although we haven't implemented it yet, of uh, annotating data streams. And so, for example, what we want to do is we want to have a, co a concept of system annotations and then user-defined annotations. And these basically uh, are just going to be string metrics. And so when we detect like bad data coming in, well, we would generate a system annotation there so that hopefully you've got something that's reading this and say, oh no, I'm generating system annotations because uh, I changed the data type or something silly like that, which we do see a lot because we have users who write their own um, agent plugins to return data off of their, their, their internal systems, and uh, we get all kinds of stuff. And so we try, to, uh, we try to do a lot of validation to make sure 
that uh, the data before it goes into the database is correct and report some kind of error if it's not. Okay, so maybe my question, uh, what if a slot is not uh, rolled up because uh, signals are still incoming and I'm queried for the slot, for the data? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, okay, I've got the slot, the data are, uh, signals for the slots are still incoming, so I understand that it's not rolled up, but I want to query for uh, the value oh. set. So the question is, um, well, what if the, the query period is for a part of time where the data hasn't been rolled up yet? We currently address this um, on the query level by automatically rolling that up. We don't write it to the database, but we just roll it up, make the computation, and give it to the user. Um, you said you're starting from zero every two weeks. Yes. Um, are you doing that by rotating column family keys or something more sophisticated? Ah. So those shards wrap to zero every two weeks, and the main reason we did this is that... Um, to limit the number of rows that end up in the, in the state tables. Um, we could have gone to some other kind of, uh, of a hashing scheme where as time goes forward, the shard ID kind of marches forward with it um, in, in five minute increments. But uh, we, we just wanted something that wraps so we would have a predictable number of rows and the data, you know, it just gets overwritten as, a, as, as time wraps around. Hi, uh, I have a question. If you compare this system, like from performance point of view or, or resources, to some analytical database, uh, some column store, Elasticsearch, or something else, like what what's the difference there? Thanks. Difference as far as performance. Uh, the general use of resources, like if you were to store this as an Elasticsearch and query it real time, don't precompute it. Like, is there any benefit there? We haven't done any um, like um, comparisons between other other storage systems. We we kind of had an idea of what we wanted to build when we when we started out. There there weren't a lot of things that were off the shelf ready and did the kinds of things that we wanted, and so um, there wasn't a lot to to compare to at the time. We started this project, I'd say, probably last uh, last June, and so that's to, to be honest, we haven't done a, a lot of comparisons. Um, we're currently pushing on our on our 32 node Cassandra cluster. I believe it was um, seven million Cassandra operations. Um, I don't want to lie; it was either per minute or per hour. But it's I mean it was a it was quite a bit of, of load on our on our Cassandra system, our Cassandra cluster, which was handling that fine. And so we're doing quite a bit of work. Our goal was for this system to be able to handle 20 million metrics or 20 million signals per minute. And so that's, that's what we built for, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to be able to handle that and more. Um, everything that we've done in our staging testing indicates that we're not going to have any problems scaling to that level. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, did you consider a, and try to calculate all these maths uh, on the flight when signals are not coming? Because I understand you do the bulk uh, computing, but maybe will be also worth of you know, calculating them on the flight and have all these values uh, in place immediately. Yes, we, we did consider doing all the computations on the fly, but we would run into the problem that um, we couldn't guarantee how fast that those computations were going to take. Some queries might be for just uh, you know, three hours worth of data, and, which would be a really quick computation, and some queries might be for two years worth of data, which would be you know, a computation that would, that would take more time. And so that's why we opted for taking the roll-up approach, was to guarantee a constant, uh, predictable read path. Uh, did you have any plans for um, federating these clusters to support higher write loads? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So if I wanted to write more than 20 million events per minute, um, how, how could I do that? Right. What you would end up doing is bumping the shard count to some bigger number you know, for probably however many nodes you plan on having, uh, say 512 or 1024, and then uh, just assigning the shards to, to your nodes. Um, so maybe if you wanted to start with an eight node cluster with 512 shards, you know, divide eight into 512 and that's how many shards you give per node. 
Um, and then as those nodes start to, um, as you realize that those nodes are taking too long to process their shards, you would add, no, add more nodes and then give some of the shards to them. And so it, we, it scales along the number of shards. If I wanted one cluster, sorry. If I wanted one cluster in Europe and one in the United States, is that somehow possible, or do you plan for that to be possible? That is possible, but right now the problem with that would be um, uh, probably with Zookeeper. Um, Zookeeper doesn't tolerate our. We have our our Zookeeper. I believe it lives in one data center right now, and it's just uh, the lock latency of like going from uh, locks in London to Chicago or wherever our, our Zookeeper is. It, uh, it's just sometimes we have crappy results. So probably once we get the zookeeper locks away that uh, we'll be able to do something like that cross continent. Um, we currently have the, the, the cluster split out between Chicago and Dallas and that's fine. We haven't, haven't uh, seen any problem with that. Any, Thanks everybody. Any further questions? Uh, sorry.